Right. Well, wow, good to see everyone. I'm sorry to start a little bit later, but let's get, let's get started. And uh, please, brother, you would turn to Revelation 19, and uh, I will go there. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open your word together to, again, be with God, your people, uh, and uh, strengthen uh, each other by uh, our presence and by our encouragements and our words of, of love for one another. Lord, help us now as we uh, open up this portion. Uh, give us insight to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, turn to chapter 19, um, 19 uh, starting with verse 11. Uh, and uh, we kind of I gave you the chapter 18. Just tell me. All right, Dale, that's enough. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, 18 and through 19, um, we, we looked at the, 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 uh, the, the Babylon, the city of Babylon is being compared, long-term vision to chapter 21 to the new Jerusalem. But in the, in the immediate state, it's the harlot and the bride that are being contrasted between 18 and 19. And uh, we saw that, uh, how the... Uh, the earthly city collapses in chapter 18, uh, but the the the, uh, the Zion uh, uh, is uh, is rocking, so to speak, with uh, great uh, uh, rejoicing. Uh, we moved from the woes to the hallelujahs, from a, to the, from a ghost town of silence where the millstone goes into the sea, uh, to the the boom town of of God's glory. Uh, from the silence of death to the to the this uh, deafening sound of God's servants uh, rejoicing together uh, in, in that. So the uh, the the heart is stripped naked in the one, and then the, the bride is dressed uh, in as a wedding gown for her her husband. So uh, no contrast could be greater between 19, uh, 18 and nineteen. It's unmistakable. Uh, except perhaps the contrast between this worship feast and the wedding feast that is coming up in the next scene. There's a wedding feast in chapter 19, and then there's a, this, this other feast that is a feast of judgment uh, there. So um, l let me read to, to you from, uh, from 19, 19 11. I, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one but he himself knows. He is dressed in a robe dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. But out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh are written this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men, the horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the, the, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who would perform the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had uh, deluded those who would receive the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Well, it's a pretty strange, difficult passage, isn't it? Uh, it's pretty uh, graphic. It doesn't get more graphic in some of the movies that are being made in Hollywood. But, uh, but, we, but we move here from this, this heavenly praise to a holy war in chapter 19. 
uh, from the bride who is ready and righteous to the, the bride riding on the uh, horses as, a, as an army behind this great rider. And from this post uh, uh, second coming scene of verses 1 through 10 of chapter 19 to the second coming of Christ himself in 11 to 21. From what John saw in heaven to what John sees on earth and from the, the marriage supper of the Lamb to the great supper of God, it's called uh, eating of uh, those who are uh, against him. And so uh, you really see three pictures here. The, the rider on the white horse in verses 11 through 16. And then you see an angel in the sun that's calling out to these birds that are flying midair in verses 17 and 18. And then thirdly, the beast meets the rider in verses 19 through 21. In the first section, the characteristics, characteristics of the rider are what we're going to focus on, what is focused on. Uh, and then the call is what is talked about in the second section. And then the clash of the actual battle in the third section of these two armies. So only to be uh, interrupted by the two angels with the words uh, uh, we might remember that the apostles heard in Acts chapter 1, remember that, where uh, Jesus ascended into heaven and the angel said, uh, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Uh, this same Jesus has been taken up to heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go to heaven. Uh, this same Jesus will come in glory one day as he ascended in glory. And when he does, uh, we who love him will naturally uh, uh, will be with him and gather to him, given the new heaven and new earth. But uh, I hope you, you see the great contrast between the Jesus of the Gospels and the Jesus in this chapter. It's kind of startling, isn't it? It almost takes your breath away. Uh, the Jesus who was compassionate and loving and patient and caring to all he met in the Gospels. And then the Jesus who comes here with, uh, as, a, as a rider, as leading an army uh, who, who kills and is dripped in blood uh, there. The contrast couldn't be greater. It's the same Jesus. And then we have to deal with uh, this. It's not as if Jesus is schizophrenic. And then we, have, we see one side of Jesus in the Gospels, and then now, now we find the other side here in the, in the final day of judgment. I think it shows us, among other things, and be thinking of that, I'd, I'd like to see your thoughts. I think it shows us, among other things, how terrible sin really is. I think that's the message. That, that not how different Jesus is, uh, but how terrible that the one who can be and is so compassionate and loving, is also the one who rightly judges sin in the end. Uh, that, the message is not the contrast between, oh, different God, different, you know, what, the thing is that sin is that bad, that that one who would love so much would now be uh, willing and, and able and, and, uh, and will judge the world. Yeah, I think I'll bring something up there. You know, I don't want to bring any politics in, but just recently, all the you were hearing on the TV, where now politicians are saying, oh, Jesus is so kind, and why is you know this happening and treating these children? Because Jesus is this, that, and the other. It's mm -hmm. amazing how the public now is all of a sudden saying, Jesus is so kind. <laughs> and if you read this, and you can see that there's both. You have yeah. to. Have yeah, and the liberal, the liberal answer, liberal theologically uh, answer, is is more consistent. It's more easy to understand. That Jesus is only this. He's not that over there. That's more consistent. We can get our head around that. Uh, but the scriptures reveal that he's both, as as the scriptures reveal that God is both. That God is love, is love, and yet God will judge and is holy and righteous. And this we have difficulty with, but it's the truth. And God gives us the truth. So, yeah, uh, Barry, you're going to say something? About uh, 40 years ago, we went to part of that passage. That whole thing, I wasn't a believer at the time. And I'm thinking, yeah, he's coming back with his army, you know, all in white, and there I am. Well, I'm, I'm done, because there I am, an unregenerate individual. 
getting ready to stand in front of 40 years later, it's, you know, Jesus is not paranoid skits. In other words, he's loving and caring that the gospel, but he also warned the future judgment of his parables. Yep. And now it's coming to pass. It and it's comes. like the wall's going, wait a minute, something's wrong with this picture. Yeah, it's, it's not another Jesus, it's not a different Jesus, but it's the same Jesus. Uh, but uh, the same one that slipped in into our world through the back door in Bethlehem now comes through the front door uh, in all judgment. And it will come to a, a clashing in of uh, the evil that has gone on. Um, this same Jesus is coming. He's coming as the only one who is qualified to put things right again. Uh, he will ride to victory and rule in equity. Uh, he makes war and he brings justice. And, uh, and we see that in the Old Testament. The, the, the Old Testament God is the God of love. Uh, it's not like love started with Jesus. He's the God of, of love there, compassionate, loving to generations, keeping faithful, uh, faithful God to, to generations, uh, slow to anger. Uh, and, and yet we find that, that the Lord of the Old Testament is also the Lord, the warrior God, who comes and judge, judges sin. Uh, so it's, it's there both in the Old Testament. That's not just in the contrast here. So we would uh, draw a picture which tells us uh, 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 when this would happen. If we were making a picture of the second coming or telling, let's find out all the facts, we'd want to know when, right? That's probably what we all thought. Uh, we'd want to know uh, how this all works together. Uh, we want to know what the, the judgment of the wicked will actually be like. But we're, we're, we're given a picture here in Revelation 19, a picture that God describes of the rider of the white horse. This is what God wants us to see. This is the picture he wants us to see. The focus is upon him uh, to remind us of his full uh, credentials as being righteous to, uh, to the end. And the, fully righteous to do this act. And so what we see in, 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 in verses 11 through 16, uh, four, we see four names given there. And then we also see six descriptive features uh, from head to toe. So the four names, what are some of the names there? He's faithful called what? Faithful, faithful and true. true. What does that give us? What does that tell us about Jesus? That he is faith, the faithful and true one. Well, he keeps his promises, right? He will, not, will come. He told us he would come back, and he does come back. Uh, he, at verse 13, what is, uh, his name is the Word of God. But again, what, what does that tell us? That he's called the Word of God. He called the Bible the Word of God, but Jesus is called the Word of God, too. Living Word. Living Word, right. He's, he's God's very message to us. He's the very uh, uh, way in which God communicates to us. We know God through Jesus. There's no coincidence that we know God better or we know God fully through Jesus. Because that's what he is, the word of God to us. Look at verse 16, his robe. There's a name on the robe uh, and, uh, and on the thigh of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the one who rules over all rulers. Uh, there is no higher authority than your Savior, Jesus Christ. His word is the final word. And then look at, too, he has a name written that, in verse 12, uh, that no one knows. Here's another name that, that's a name that we, uh, no name, uh, that we don't know, that we don't know. But it speaks of his uniqueness, of the mystery of Christ, that we don't fully understand him, uh, that he is powerful and sovereign. To know one's name in ancient culture was uh, to reveal yourself to them and, and to maybe even give them too much information about yourself uh, so they can have power over you in some kind of spiritual way. And so in this sense, the name that is not known shows us that no one has power over uh, this Savior. He is the, the Savior, the Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. And therefore, no one can stop him when he comes. He has the power and the right to judge and to make war. So four names. And then look at the six features from head to toe. Uh, his head uh, are what? Many crowns. Many crowns. Remember, the dragon had seven crowns, and the uh, beast had ten crowns. 
But Jesus has many more than them. He has many crowns. Uh, they are no match for him, these, these opponents. Look at his eyes. They are a blazing fire. Uh, it reminds us that was told to Jesus in chapter 1. We saw the vision, vision of, the, of the Lord there as well. That he knows what's going on. That his judgments are just. That he uh, is not going to be incorrect. We're not going to find some uh, flaw in his judgment. And, uh, years later, there's not going to be any committee that kind of researches it and says, oh, you know, this is wrong and this was done wrong. No, there's not going to be any of that. That's, it's, he's, his eyes see perfectly. One person put it, none can hide from his heart-piercing gaze. Remember, uh, Peter couldn't hide from that gaze when Jesus and, and he locked uh, 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 together in the eyes. Uh, Jesus saw that. Jesus sees it all. Jesus knows it all. Um, uh, nothing will, as Jesus taught, nothing will be concealed at the end. Uh, or in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 61, as we looked out, that he very much, this passage is based on 61, that, that he has the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, that he will judge by what he, see, uh, what he sees with his eyes, nor decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. And with justice, he will give uh, the decisions for the poor of the earth. So it's very much this uh, drawing upon Isaiah 61. And then his robe is dripped in what? Blood. And we, our first th thought is, that, well, he died, you know, and so his death is blood, blood, you know, he's shed. But that's not the context here. It's not a redemptive context. It's a judgment context. Um, we might think, whose blood? It doesn't even say it's his blood. It's dripped with blood. Uh, uh, probably it's, if you've ever seen the movie Braveheart, those who are in the, uh, that fight the, the battle are dripping in blood. At the end, those are survivors. They're oozing with blood if you're dying. But if you've been the victor, you're dripped and covered in blood. And Jesus, this is a graphic way of seeing the, the battle uh, that uh, Jesus comes uh, to fight, uh, uh, and the sense is there. And then his mouth is uh, this razor sword. And again, these are symbols. It's not like we're going to look at Jesus and see this giant sword, you know, sweeping around back and forth at people. That's not the, the point. Is something else. It's symbolic of of his his of, of his defeat of his of his uh, enemies. That he will cut them down with his very word. And then the rod of iron, his hand, he holds a rod of iron. He goes going back to uh, Psalm 2. The kings of earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And the one in heaven laughs. He rebukes them with his anger, terrifies them with his wrath. He says, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. He will rule them with an iron scepter and you will dash them to pieces with thy pottery. So what was hoped for in the king of the Old Testament, the king David or Solomon or whoever, uh, is now finally fulfilled in Jesus, who is, is, the, is the king of kings and lord of lords. Um, so he has this, and then the sixth feature, uh, his feet, what are what his feet? His feet, will, feet are ones that trample down with fury his foes. Uh, and he's trampling down the grapes. It's like the image of a wine press and people going to, through the wine press and, and uh, stamping, crushing the grapes. Uh, the, the world will be crushed under his justice. Um, and so we, we ask ourselves, why such grisly uh, images, even revolting images? Well, it will be one, it will be as, ever bit as bad as these images. And it's meant to assure us even Christ's church, that we are uh, the ones uh, who will try. Remember, the, the context of this, uh, or the people who are being written to are not people who are fairly well-off Americans uh, that don't have much persecution. Remember, these are people who are on the front lines. These are the people like in China or in other places today where they are uh, uh, being persecuted. And, and this is a great assurance to them that the judgment will come upon those who hurt their families and do terrible things to them. Um, uh, 
you may suffer injustice is what is being said to these people, but the warrior is coming and he will bring justice. Um, uh, they didn't see that day in the first century, but they will see it. All God's people will see it eventually. And it, it, and it shows us that all the wrongs, we've been seeing this theme throughout Revelation and throughout the scriptures, all the wrongs will be made right. The wicked will be uh, uh, put down. And evil will, is not an eternal thing. We tend to get used to evil because we live in it and we participate in it and we it, it receive evil from others. But it's, it's not eternal. It's going to be over. And so... Uh, Part of the answer to the problem of evil, the so-called problem of evil for Christians, is 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 the rider here in the white horse. Uh, we would uh, have uh, a a real problem if, if he never came, if he never rode. Uh, that would mean that God would be indifferent to evil and would let it go, and He's not going to do that. Eventually, it will be over, and this is a picture of of that, a very graphic picture of that. And it's a picture of what's said um, directly uh, in what Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1 says, God is just, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled uh, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's what is pictured here in Revelation 19 is clearly taught uh, is part of the, the, the Christian message of the early church uh, that this would uh, come and that Jesus had taught this. And so uh, uh, that's uh, 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 we're being told that that's not the God of the Bible, but it is the God of the Bible. If we look here, the world is a provisional place, as one person put it. It's going to pass, as we'll see in the, even the text this morning and Sunday. Question, uh, uh, sort of, uh, questions you may have? Um, now in 14, where it talks about armies in heaven, clothed in heaven, white and clean, following him on mm -hmm. the forces. Yep. What does that specifically refer to armies in heaven? Yeah, I mean, it could be angels of coming with him, uh, but but it, he he says uh, uh, it, it seems to be the church though. Yeah. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on the white horses, dressed. They're dressed in fine linen. Well, where do we see fine linen? Back in verse eight, fine linen, bright and clean. Is the, is the bride is dressed in. Yeah, so I think it's not angels. Right? I, mean, I mean, it's still going through that warfare, so that's why I was just. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good figure question. Figure out why it's in heaven and not. Also, with him on the earth, as yeah. Yeah. Um, part of the answer could be just simply uh, as engineer. We can't interpret Revelation as engineers. Remember, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's not That's trying right. to give us a, a logical, a, a, you know, a play-by-play -play of how it goes on. But, but I think even uh, beyond that, that these these uh, these ones who come, uh, when we see in First Thessalonians chapter four where there would, well, the, there's a rapture, there's a rapture, we all believe in a rapture, there's a rapture up to the king of kings and lord of lords. And then he comes from the skies to heaven with his people. So we will be with him uh, at, at the point of, of the, the second coming. Yeah. We'll be drawn up to meet him in the air. All those who are, are struggling on earth will be drawn up to meet him in the air. And then they will come with him as the armies of heaven. Uh, in that, so I think it is logical. You know, this one does fit logically. We don't have to, uh, but we'll be with them there. We'll be drawn to him. Go out to meet. And even that word rapture, the idea is to come to meet a king outside the city. When a king would come to a city and the people would want to greet him, they would come from the city to meet the king. And then the king would go in with them into, the, into their city. And that, that's kind of the same thought of meeting him in the air, going out to meet him uh, there, and then coming with him uh, in his glory. Uh, so uh, uh, so I think I, I thought that same thing, Bruce, and that, that uh, kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> where, where are they coming from? But it does make it pretty clear that these armies are you know, the bride uh, that's dressed in fine linen uh, there. Um, 
What do we need to know before we, the, the, the second coming comes? Uh, partly we need to know that the, the Savior that we worship is this Savior who is just and will put everything right. Somehow he'll put everything right in your life. We, get, we don't think how that can be. Yeah. How could he do that? But he will put it all right and in, in his judgment. And, and so uh, we, we need to know that. But then he, we were given a second picture in, in verses 17 and following. Uh, and these are getting even more graphic. You know, a couple more pictures here. One in 17 and 18, then another picture in 19 through 21. One of a great supper of God and the other of a, of a war to end all wars. <laughs> uh, the last battle, if you will. Uh, the great last struggle. And both pictures depict really, I think, the same thing. They're just different pictures of it. And they give us several truths in each picture. Uh, they're all, first of all, they're all the gory. It's a gory thing. It's an invitation to a gory supper is the first picture, um, which is in contrast to the, the wedding supper in verse 9. Uh, the wedding supper is the church is invited. Now the great supper, uh, birds, uh, vultures, not little sparrows, but birds that eat flesh uh, are invited. And, and, and in the first one, we eat with Christ and with each other. But in the second one, these vultures eat the flesh of God's foes. Um, the unbeliever is eaten. Now, again, that's not literal that, 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 that their life and existence and their soul is over. Again, it's a picture of, of being utterly defeated. Uh, a picture of the, of the enemies of God being uh, no more. Uh, uh, a problem uh, for God's people uh, there. Uh, also, the eating of, of the flesh, if we go back to the Old Testament, is a sign of, of being cursed. Uh, in Deuteronomy 28, 26, God's people told they, you know, there would be the blessings of the covenant that kept the covenant and the curses of the covenant if they didn't kept, keep the Mosaic covenant. And it says there in verse 25, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies if you, if you uh, survey him. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven directions. And you will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms on earth. Your carcasses will be food for all the birds and the air and the beasts of the earth. And there will be no more, no one to frighten them away. So this is the picture drawn from the Old Testament of of curse. If, if, you, if you disobey the Lord, you'll be cursed and you'll be eaten by birds. Uh, is the sign of that curse. Yeah. What's uh, the reference there? Uh, uh, Deuteronomy 28, 26, 25, 26. Deuteronomy uh, 28, uh, 25, and 25 and following, yeah. Uh, so there you, you it's, again, I haven't done a lot of work with you to, to show you how the images of Revelation draw from the Old Testament. They're just full of, of allusions to the Old Testament. Uh, we can just spend our time, the whole time, just drawing scriptures. But this is one that really helps us see that. Also in Ezekiel 39.4, uh, we see the same thing. Um, uh, that this idea, let me read that section. It says, uh, well, in, in verse... Uh, is it's for yeah? I will give you the food for all kinds of, of of birds and wild animals, and you will fall in the open field. For I have spoken, declares the Lord. Again, you will be food for the for for birds. Is a, a, a Old Testament cursing. So uh, we see here the certainty of this triumph. I mean, there can't be more certain triumph than to be eaten. <laughs> You're gone. That's that's it. Uh, we see the finality of this judgment. Uh, here we uh, see no living, uh, no one is living to fight another day, so to speak. There is no other day. This is the finality to it. Jesus will take no prisoners. It's, it's over uh, there. And then we see the universality of the judgment. Uh, not some, but all will fall on that day. Everyone outside of Christ will be eaten up. The soldiers and civilians, horses and riders, powerful and weak, free and slave small and great. It's all there. All who have received that mark of the beast, who have wealth, willfully taken on the, the anti-Christ uh, uh, stance uh, uh, will be, be there. That's everyone who's a sinner. Everyone who stands with the beast falls with the beast in the end. 
And, and so, the, and then the second picture, the, the picture in verses 19 through 21, really at the pity, I think the same thing, the final judgment. The, the world is depicted as, as forming battle lines against God. And we think, wow, now this is going to be really exciting. We're going to see this battle. You know, battles are interesting to see for at least some of us that like that kind of thing. Uh, and we, well, now we're going to really see what happens in the this, this strategy and the, uh, the, the, the tactics that are used and whatnot. And we'll, we'll see this, the greatest of all battle scenes. This is the end. But no battle is described at all. Did you notice that? <laughs> no battle is described at all. Uh, a, a bull by bull struggle is not the picture that we see. The beasts don't fight to the death as we would expect them to. They don't fight at all. They merely are immediately captured. And, and this is this would make a terrible war picture. Yeah. You want to spend money? You know, Hollywood wants to spend money on it because it's over very quickly. We all go home. You know that's the picture, but that's the way it's, it's made to be that way. So that we see that, that Armageddon really is an anti-climax. Uh, and that's the point. That there would be this, when people will finally try to stand up uh, in, in, together in this picture, they, they just don't even have a chance. It's just over before it even begins. And so, again, that's the help us see the finality of this uh, judgment. Um, and we, we see this in, in Paul's depiction of the, of the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. It's, it's, it's before even, as he just, he's revealed and then it's depicted, he's gone. It's about as quickly as he's revealed. And then it's the very presence of God, just he melts away uh, in it. So again, this is to show us the finality that, that the world and evil cannot even get close. You're not gonna, it's not gonna be, oh, the Lord, what a close one there at the end, you know? It was a, it was a, 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 a what do you call it, a buzzer beater, or whatever those are, you know, that, it was just right down to the wire, you know? No, it's not, it's gonna be taken, it's not down to the wire. It's a boring game, and it's a boring war. It's just over, but it's a great war, because now evil is over. Yeah. Wouldn't that be like what you expect God to do? He created the, the world. Everything with it are his work. Yeah. So you don't think there's going to be anybody that can really oppose him. Yeah. So that's a reality as opposed to what we see in movies and everything else. You know, the, the good guy starts getting beaten and all that, and he finally recovers, and he beats him up. Right. We but, love that story. story. The Rocky story. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But yeah, here so, so people are drawing, you know, these, these crazy, you know, the tanks are going to build up and then to the war thing and all that stuff. It's not what the scripture says. That's not what, say, what the Revelation says. It's over before it begins. He's the breath of his mouth. He's done. They're done. As soon as they start to form, they're they're gone. Uh, and that's that's a great picture for us. Really, that there's not going to be a close one. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a final one from the beginning. So the picture doesn't describe a battle, but it does remind us of, of the enemy. Look at verse 20. Uh, this is what this focused upon. Satan, through his beast, wants people's very soul. And it is all about uh, worship, isn't it? Uh, who are we worshiping? You know, I was thinking about this morning. We sometimes think um, that, uh, you know, we as Christians should have a better way of living. We should, have, we should show that we have the the better marriage or the better mental capacity or the better this. We may not. We're struggling as a sinful people still. But what is really different about us from the world is that we're our focus now and our worship is to God. That's the difference. It's not that it's a perfect worship or a perfect life, but it's, it's a di completely radically different life because it's now worshiping God. So instead of standing up against God uh, in battle lines, we're the ones who are saying, Lord, take me, mold me, use me, transform me. Uh, may you be worshipped. May you be glorified in me. That's a radical difference. That's the radical difference. That our, our direction and our goals and our priorities are completely radically different than the world. Not that our success level is greater. You know, we tend to fall and think our success level should be better. We should have the better marriage. We should have the better life. We should have, you know, 
Uh, no, it's, it's our, our life is directed in a completely different way and orientation than, than the world. They are standing up against them. But ultimately, that's what sin is, sinners are doing. They're standing in battle lines against the Lord. And, and that's the difference for the ones who stand in battle lines and those who come with him in, in, in glory and are dressed in fine linen. Yeah, very. Woodrow Wilson had that little phrase, the war to end all wars after World War I. Yeah. He was a bit off a few years. And also, the only truly just war, you know, we had these people say, yeah. you know, uh, this war was unjust, that one was just. Yeah, yeah. This is the truly, this, this is the war that end all wars, and it's the fully only just, and only true just war that ever really, there's always a mixture in every war, even the best of wars, I mean, yes. in a sense of, or the most necessary of wars, there's always evil mixed in there. But this will, there will be no evil in this war yeah. uh, at all uh, there. Yeah, come on in. When a, a just God, he's merciful, these people were deceived. It's not like because they chose to be you know, in the first place, all hmm. these, but they were deceived and attracted. Good question. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's saying that. Uh, I'm sorry, here, here it, uh, that that isn't there some mercy for people who are being deceived by the uh, beast? Uh, um, and yet, yeah, there, there's a deception. But I think if you take that deception in the wider context of Scripture, it's a willful deception. Yeah. They want to be deceived. I mean, they are deceived in one sense, but they're, in another sense, they're saying, yeah, I really want to believe this beast, and I really want to go this way, and this is the path of least resistance for me. Uh, I, I want to go that way. And so, yeah, it's not as that they're deceived in the sense that they are innocent, because then it would be, we would be unjust to, to, to judge them if they're totally in, if, if, if that means they're innocent. But, but the wider view of scripture is that people aren't innocent. That uh, what, it, uh, what is it in, in Second Thessalonians where it says the God of this age has blinded the the eyes of the unbeliever? But Paul goes on right in that same context to talk about the responsibility. So it's it's not it is a blindness and it is a deception, but it is a, a there's a con contribution of the sinner to that deception <laughs> and to that blindness uh, that is there. Yeah, good question though. That's uh, excellent. Because they, yeah. Yeah. On that note, I would mean, make a good point is we're all born children of wrath. Yeah. Um, and if Satan calls up, you know, unless you've been born again, you're um, yeah. Satan's, you know, offspring. So it's the idea of you know, that. But also, it's, I look at chapter 19 and, you know, all through the Psalms, David is praying that vengeance is brought upon his enemies and the yep. adversaries of God. Yep. And Isaiah, um, but even in the New Testament, Paul says in Romans, um, the Lord will repay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is what's he repaying? And this is a perfect illustration of because he's the he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on the white horse. <coughs> but he was the king of kings and lord of lords as he came across cross and yes. took all of the sin and all of the wrath that we deserved. Like we deserve all of this as much as any exactly. word the Lord didn't choose. And how how for we need to see this as Christians, that this is what we deserve. I deserve yeah. and we had our whole mountain park burned by the fire. I mean, it's I mean it's gone. It looks like a planetary landscape. Mm. But you know what was out there? It's all the dead carcasses and vultures. Mm. I mean, it's covered, and they're fat. So when it says, you know, the, wow. the birds were gorged, I mean, they are the healthiest things we have living around. They fly even over our house, because there's so many of them. Yeah. Because oh. um, there's the only thing that'll eat uh, carrion. Mm. Mm. And everything else will go by with the birds. But they'll, they'll eat the, 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 the flesh. And, yeah, and, yeah. You know, so, I mean, it's just. Yeah, the picture. Um, yeah, it does. It, it's, yeah, it, it, we always get to keep coming back to grace, don't we? It is grace. I mean, there but but uh, by the grace of God go I. Uh, my dad, I'll tell you this, I remember this very vividly, and always this stuff with me. 
you know, I was asking some similar question that he said about God's judgment, and, and he, he told me, he said, I was a kid, I was probably 12 years old or something, uh, he said, uh, you know, we'll stand on that day of judgment, God divides the sheep and the goats, and, and we'll say, why are we not on the other side of this cancer? There's no other reason but the, joy, the grace of God, the love of God, that we are here and not there, and they are there and not here. Uh, it all comes back to God's grace. He's been gracious to us. And, and, and the necessity of a, of a heart being regenerated by the Spirit of God, it's never going to believe. It's never going to respond. It's going to be over here, you know, and for eternity, and, and unless God intervenes and, and changes the heart. Uh, and, and, uh, and and he does do that. He does do that. Oh, and good good question. It's good. I mean, it's a gory scene, isn't it? Uh, uh, but it but it's a nece- it's a necessary scene for us to see of how evil sin is and how terrible it is. Uh, that that's what people and that, that that's a theme. I've just been more and more impressioned by the fact that that's what people are like. Really, they're not the good pagan. They're in the end, they're standing in battle lines against uh, God and his son. But that's, that's what worse sin places us. And that's why it's so terrible. That's why it has to be judged in the end. Uh, so uh, be encouraged that God has opened your heart and be hopeful that God will open the hearts of people around you, that you know that you're placed in a certain spot by no coincidence by God, so that others can see Christ in you and others can hear of the Savior. And that's the very word is what faith cometh by hearing. Uh, faith comes by hearing and seeing and, uh, the, the, the scriptures in, in you and your commitment and in uh, the scriptures. So be encouraged that God is doing a great work, saving even thousands daily, uh, one way or another. Uh, so be encouraged by that. But be encouraged too that, that evil will be over. Uh, one day. Uh, so let's close with that. Father, uh, thank you that you have given us this picture to see that you will come. The same Jesus will come again. Uh, not to save the world, but to judge the world. And Lord, by your grace, we will be the ones caught up in the air with you. We'll be the ones with fine linen and the ones uh, coming and in, in, in sharing your victory. Um, Lord, it humbles us to think that, that you would be so good to us. Why us? Why, why us? We keep asking. But you have, and, and now we have to realize what now calling you've given us because of that, and the obligation to serve you. And so help us, Lord, to uh, think of that and how we are to serve you. What is the best way? Uh, Lord, use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.